Muchas gracias por el interés en conectarse y hacer parte del ciclo de conferencias virtuales sobre, sobre el PVC que hemos venido liderando desde la mesa del PVC de Acoplásticos. Me presento para las personas que no me conocen. Mi nombre es Paola Ruge, yo soy la coordinadora técnica de, de la asociación. Eh, antes de empezar, les informo que la presentación será, será grabada y posteriormente se las, se las compartiremos. Por último, todas las preguntas serán transmitidas a la conferencista al final de la charla, entonces se los, se les, se los agradezco que las pongan en, en el chat, eh, las pueden formular en español o en inglés, no, no hay problema, y se las formulamos a la, a la, a la conferencista. Eh, bueno, sin más preámbulo, ya la charla de hoy lleva por nombre Los plastificantes, infinitas oportunidades para nuestra vida cotidiana. En el webinar de hoy se presentarán eh, algunos temas, serán... Eh, eh, se, presentarán, eh, se presentará de manera general eh, European Plasticizers eh, y Vinyl Plus, que es como el programa de sustentabilidad de la cadena de valor del PVC. Se presentarán algunas tendencias del mercado de los plastificantes, muy enfoca enfocado a, a Europa, el compromiso de la industria europea de plastificantes con la ciencia, el panorama también normativo europeo y cerraremos con las aplicaciones y ventajas de los plastificantes. Nuestra conferencista de hoy es Michela Mastrantonio. Él es, ella es graduada de Relaciones Internacionales de la Universidad de Roma, La Sapienza, con máster en Estudios Europeos en el Instituto de Estudios Europeos de la Universidad Libre de Bruselas. Desde el 2013 hace parte del Consejo Europeo de la Industria pues... Química, CEPIC, y ella trabaja allí para el Grupo Sectoral European Plasticizers y contribuye activamente al programa eh, Vinyl Plus. Actualmente ella es la directora de, directora de European okay. Plastic Centers. Eh, Michela, thank you so much for accepting this invitation. To us, it's an honor to, to have you as a, as a speaker. So eh, I think that you, you can start. Thank you so much. Many thanks, Paula, and many thanks um, also to all those uh, who have just joined for this uh, webinar. I'm going to share the screen so that you can see the presentation. Go ahead. And I'm going to share it uh, full screen. I guess that you can see it. Yeah, it's perfect. OK. So thanks also for the introduction. So as you've just heard, I'm the manager of European Plasticizers. And uh, to start with, I'd like to share with you a short video introducing the association and plasticizers in general. But of course, I have to put this on this one, otherwise <laughs> you won't see it. Let's hope that it will more work smoothly. What do you see? Look at this building. What do you see? Look at this. Does it building. remind you of your office? Does it remind you of your it office? It looks like a museum. What about this car? Does it remind you of your daily commute? Or maybe a family road trip? When you think of construction, transport, healthcare, and many more essential sectors, plasticizers might not be the first thing that comes to mind. But thanks to them, the opportunities are infinite. Plasticizers help make rigid PVC flexible. And once PVC is made flexible, it can be used for a myriad of applications that bring major benefits to society. Take wires and cables, for example. Thanks to a sheath made of flexible PVC, electricity can be delivered safely to your home. Be it your kitchen appliances, computers or smartphones, they can all be powered safely thanks to plasticizers. Even when they're plugged in year round, like your fridge. As the voice of the industry, European Plasticizers provides evidence-based information on plasticizers. We strive to help recognize and appreciate plasticizers for their sustainable and innovative contributions to everyday well-being, always in a responsible manner. Because plasticizers are such widely used substances, we believe it is essential to provide evidence-based information on plasticizers and their safe use. So one of the core activities of European plasticizers is to serve as a hub for sound science. For that, we carry out and promote scientific studies around the safe use of plasticizers, as well as the opportunities they offer. 
European plasticizers is anchored in science and one of our key roles is to monitor European regulations. By conducting research and sharing our results, we ensure that regulatory bodies can take into account the latest and most reliable science, helping them to reach truly informed decisions. And when it comes to giving a voice to the plasticizer industry, the topic of sustainability is one that lies at the heart of our activities. European Plasticizers is a founding member of the Vinyl Plus Initiative. This is a 20-year commitment launched by the PVC industry to promote the sustainable use of PVC throughout the entire value chain. This example, among others, is a token of our commitment to building a more sustainable society. In short, we are not just a trade organisation. We are scientists, policy professionals and experts whose mission is to share with you the benefits, innovations and infinite opportunities brought on by plasticizers to contribute to your well-being. Okay, many thanks for your attention um, while I was uh, showing this video. This is um, representative of uh, our work and illustrates our activity in a nutshell. Now, let's go uh, a bit more into the details. Um, European Plasticizers is a, a sector group of CEFIC, which is uh, the European Association representing the chemical industry. And uh, um, we have 10 members. You see the logo on the, on the um, screen. And uh, we represent approximately, but I would say even a, a bit more of 90% of the plasticizers manufactured in Europe. European Plasticizers uh, is committed to a safe and sustainable use of plasticizers in all applications. And we like focusing on the fact that uh, we are an association made by people and uh, we speak with one voice for a united industry and uh, an industry which is in constant evolution. Our mission is uh, uh, to provide evidence-based information on plasticizers and promote their use and benefits in everyday life, since we are the voice of European plasticizer industry in, your, uh, in Europe. Yeah. Our vision is for plasticizers to be recognized and appreciated for their sustainable contribution to everyday well-being. And our values are um, evidence-based, proactive, responsible, and innovative. As Paula mentioned in the introduction, I'd like to, um, to give you a short overview of uh, the progresses made in Europe by the PVC value chain. Vanil Plus, uh, it's a program, a voluntary program that was funded in the year 2000 and um, that has achieved important results over the past 20 years. It, uh, it's a quite a unique um, initiative since uh, it's uh, representative of the whole value chain of PVC. It regroups uh, ECVM, which is the association representing the resins producers, ESPA, the stabilizers, plasticizers represented by us, as well as converters. And uh, we are also um, very much um, in contact with the RecoVinyl, uh, which is an association representing about 150 recycling partners. And we work very close to the Natural Step, which is an NGO which helps us in achieving our sustainability objectives. As I said, Vinyl Plus exists already for 20 years. And last year, we signed the new commitment for the next 10 years. Um, here on the screen, on this slide, you can see the achievements in terms of um, PVC rec recycling. Uh, we, we may know the benefits of PVC, but it's important for us and for the industry uh, to communicate uh, the fact that PVC can be recycled and is therefore um, a polymer that can be used in a sustainable manner. And uh, since the creation of Vinyl Plus, 7.3 million tons of PVC were recycled. Uh, mainly, um, these are window profiles and related products, uh, but also there's an important part of flexible PVC and films including roofing and waterproofing membranes, then cables, um, followed by pipes and fitting and other rigid applications. 
the recycling achievements also reflect achievements in terms of uh, sustainability since uh, uh, 14.5 million tons of CO2 were saved since 2000 and also this led to job creation in Europe. What is about uh, the next 10-year uh, commitment of Vanille Plus? Um, here you see that uh, it's a threefold commitment. Uh, we want to advance towards uh, carbon neutrality and minimizing our environmental footprint, building global coalitions and partnering for the uh, sustainable development goals of the United Nations, scaling up PVC value chain circularity. And uh, our uh, this program is also very much aligned uh, to the objectives of the European Green Deal, which is an, uh, an ambitious program of uh, the European Union. I'd like now to uh, go to the second part of this presentation, which is the uh, an overview of the European market evolution. As you can see, um, in Europe, we had an important uh, shift over the past decades from a major use of uh, low molecular weight ortho phthalates, uh, which are in green, which are which have the green color, um, to a major use of high molecular weight ortho phthalates in blue and other plasticizers and terephthalates. These are Okay, so I'm sorry. No, no problem. And, uh, and here on the last column, you see actually the split of the other plasticizers um, portion of the market. So these include, uh, for example, uh, uh, tremelitates, benzoates, cyclohexanoates. So you can really see uh, that there is a, an important transition. This transition was possible thanks to the research um, and the investments of, uh, of the plasticizer industry. Uh, so as to, to provide a um, uh, safe and sustainable solution for the industry. And uh, also it was driven partially by the, um, the regulatory attention uh, directed to these uh, substances. And um, overall, there were about 6 billion euros of industry investment to produce uh, the about 50 plasticizers which are currently commercialized in Europe. So these are about 25 years of hard work of the industry that uh, found out the 50 um, commercial use substances currently available out of the about 30,000 substances that were tested uh, for their plasticizing properties. This transition uh, towards substitution uh, um, of uh, low molecular weight orthophthalates, which are heavily regulated in Europe, to other plasticizers, including high molecular weight orthophthalates, it's uh, evident also in this slide where you have uh, an even longer time range. But what's the situation at global level? So while uh, in Europe, um, high molecular weight orthophthalates represent about half of the total consumption, which is about 1.15 million tons, followed by uh, terephthalate, uh, sorry, uh, other plasticizers, terephthalates, and then a very small amount of low molecular weight phthalates. Globally, uh, the, the, the split is very different. In fact, you can see that out of the 9 million tons of plasticizer consumed, consumed globally in 2020, a big portion, more than a quarter, is represented by low molecular weight orthophthalates, which are almost no longer existing in Europe, uh, followed by <clears throat> tariff phthalates and uh, high molecular weight phthalates and other plasticizers. Phthalates account for over 55% of world plasticizer consumption. And we see a slight decrease in the past few years due to the decreased use of low molecular weight phthalates, why the high molecular weight phthalates are still growing. Also, uh, we see that the replacement of low molecular weight phthalates with the high molecular weight phthalates and other plasticizers has already occurred in many applications, especially in uh, um, North America, uh, South America, Europe. And flexible PVC accounts for about 80-90% of global plasticizers consumption. I mentioned that about 50 substances are currently commercialized as plasticizers in Europe. On this slide, you can see that 
based on uh, the European regulation, most of uh, the big majority actually of plasticizers are non-classified. What does it mean? When a substance is not classified, uh, I'm not sure, I don't know if you are familiar with REACH and CLP, which are the main chemical regulations in Europe. When a substance is not classified, it means that it does not pose a hazard, does not constitute a hazard. And in fact, most of the plasticizers do not pose a hazard based on CLP. Only a very little part of plasticizers, which include the low molecular weight orthophthalates, are currently classified. They uh, represent a hazard and uh, they are on the rich candidate list. And uh, some of them also have uh, a pending authorization. What does it mean an authorization? An authorization is that a company needs to submit a request to be able to produce a certain substance for a very specific application within a certain time frame. And, uh, and then the commission, the ECA will decide whether to, uh, to grant this authorization. And um, this is the case for the four low molecular weight orthophthalates, DHP, DBP, DIBP, and BBP, plus DCHP, which is also classified. So you see that there's a very um, clear cut between uh, substances that can be used safely and those that are heavily restricted. But now let's uh, go uh, to our activities. So as we said, um, we act as uh, the voice of European uh, plasticizer industry, and we want to be the trusted source of information on plasticizers. And our activities is based on science, which is the driver of our advocacy and communications activity as well. Why science? Science, because there's wealth of data on plasticizers. And actually, we contribute also in some cases to the production of data. Of course, as I said, there were huge investments by the industry to produce data on plasticizers to develop alternatives and safe and sustainable products. In fact, every year we monitor the literature on plasticizers, all the scientific papers which are published. And sometimes we engage also with the scientific publications, sending letters to the editors and having uh, own uh, published uh, papers on peer-reviewed journals. We do research activity that I will um, briefly mention later. Um, and also very importantly, I believe we promote science and scientific debate via communication activities, because of course, uh, I mean, science, uh, I'm not a scientist and can be very difficult for non-scientists to understand the importance of scientific data and what do they mean especially when we come to chemical substances. And this is why we want to communicate the results in a very um, simple way. And uh, for example, we also uh, try to engage with, um, with different audiences. And recently we have run two projects aiming at uh, reaching out to students from technical universities and invited them to write um, short papers about plasticizers in terms of innovation, application, sustainability. And that was a very nice way to, to engage with them. It was a, quite a nice uh, project that we ran. And also I invite you uh, to take a look at it. It's not only about plasticizers. We, run, uh, we created a series of interviews to independent scientists <clears throat> uh, asking what's their view, their opinion on the link between uh, science, policy and public opinion. And you may be surprised to see their answer. And um, as I said, this is completely unrelated to plasticizers, but I think it's a, it's a very nice uh, uh, basis for a, a debate on this very important topic, which is the link between policy and science. Now I'll give a very short overview of some of the projects that we are running, uh, just to give you an idea of what uh, are we <laughs> trying to do. PPPK model, um, it's a very complex uh, um, project um, that we have uh, run on several plasticizers that you see on the screen and which has, um, uh, which uh, gave as a result the publication on peer reviewed journals of papers with the results of the test um, performed of the different plasticizers. And actually what the PPPK is about actually is to um, show um, it's, it's to compare human data with rats data and to see the, the relevance of this data uh, and the effect that uh, a certain substance has on a certain target organ in the human organism. 
So the results of this uh, kind of study is very important, for example, to support um, robust um, risk assessment. And this is something that is very important also for our advocacy strategy or uh, for, um, for our interaction with the institutions that may require data on our substances, of course. Another important project that I'd like to, to mention is uh, um, a study that was conducted by the University of Edinburgh and published, uh, a, a, a paper was published in December 2020, which is uh, the comparison of uh, um, DBP, which is a, a substance having uh, endocrine disrupting effects, with DINP, which is a high molecular weight orthophthalate, which is not classified, therefore pose no hazard. And, um, and actually, the study shows that, in fact, DIMP does not cause the adverse reproductive effects known to occur with DBP, a well-established endocrine disruptor. So you can see that uh, this is something very important for our activities, also at a regulatory point of view. Interesting, interesting, interestingly, well, well you, <laughs> something interesting I'd like to mention is an LRI project that we're running uh, on many um, plasticizers, about 11 plasticizers produced by our members. This project aims at calculating the um, uh, equilibrium concentration of plasticizers in indoor air with a very new technology uh, with a micro chamber that uh, enables us to reach uh, the equilibrium concentration very in a, in a much shorter uh, time frame. And um, the objective of this project is to obtain key data to address misconceptions about the impact of plasticizer on indoor air quality. This is a very uh, important issue in Europe. There's a lot of attention on indoor air. And uh, this for, therefore, this study, it's, a, it's an important tool uh, to, to prove that actually the substances can be used safely in uh, indoor applications. And there will be papers published on uh, peer-reviewed journals also on this. We can close the scientific part. And now I'd like to move to the regulatory updates for Europe. Well, before moving to this, um, I mean, we are in uh, contact uh, with uh, with a network of other associations um, representing plasticizers, for example, in the US, uh, but also in Japan. So we have an international network um, to exchange information, best practices. Uh, but of course, our focus is on Europe. So, um, but I think it's important also for you to understand what's the current situation. High molecular weight orthophthalates have been extensively evaluated due to their long-standing presence on the market in big volumes, and they're used in a very wide range of applications. They have been object of regulatory scrutiny, um, and since they are not classified under CLP, as I said, and they are not substances of very high concern, uh, according to Rich, they can be safely used. Just to give you an example, ECA assessed DIMP and DIDP, which are two major high molecular weight orthophthalates, in 2013, concluding that uh, they, uh, the, they can be safely used in current applications. And uh, uh, more recently, ECA assessed DIMP under the CLP regulation and concluded that uh, it does not warrant a classification. So as you can see, there's an ongoing work. For other plasticizers, also there's wealth of data. Some of them have... Um, have been subject to regulatory management options analysis. It's the case is, for example, for uh, ATBC, DINCH, and DOTP. And uh, the conclusion are positive in the sense that uh, there's no need to initiate further regulatory uh, risk management actions. Uh, other substances have been subject to evaluations uh, by member states. Uh, this is the case for DHA, TOTM, DIUP, etc. And some of these um, analyses are not concluded yet. And uh, also, um, DINCH, DOTP, TOTM, and BTHC have been added in January 2018 in the European Pharmacopoeia. So they can be used safely in medical devices uh, as alternatives to DHP, which is still used in medical devices, but um, based on some guidelines, actually the producers of medical devices have to prove the reason why they're still using DHP rather than the alternatives which are already available. So our role uh, as European plasticizer is to transparently engage with the regulators 
and uh, feed the debate with science. With regard to the low molecular weight orthophthalates, um, their production and use in uh, Europe is very limited. They have already been replaced in uh, practically uh, almost all the applications by high molecular weight phthalates and other plasticizers. In fact, there's a broad restriction on the main low molecular weight phthalates. Uh, they are included uh, in uh, Rich and Next 14 for their endocrine disrupting properties. And also their subject, DHP and DBP are subject to authorization, which is still pending for DHP. So very narrow use for limited time. And now here we can move to an overview of the use and application of uh, plasticizers. Um, so most of the of plasticizers produced, about 86% uh, and above, are used in PVC, mainly in wire and cable, flooring and wall covering, followed by films and sheet, coating, consumer goods, industrial applications, and other. Other often refer to, to non-PVC applications such as rubber, uh, surface coating, and elastomers. But why using PVC? Because PVC is durable and is a circular material. PVC is uh, resistant to weathering, chemical rotting, corrosion, shocks, and abrasion. And PVC can be recycled. We have seen the achievements of Vanil Plus. And uh, there are several applications where we can use recycled PVC. Traffic separators and cones, uh, soundproof walls, fences, uh, flexible hoses and tubes, and also in fashion for footwear, bags, and clothing. So there's really a lot of opportunities for PVC. Um, we also have an infographic on sustainability of PVC on our website, and you can find the link on the presentation that will be shared. Among the main, uh, <clears throat> the main uh, applications, we have seen that there's uh, films and sheets, and so roofing, coated fabric, textile architecture. Um, and PVC is using this application for their key properties. Um, so they are, they, PVC can be used in waterproofing membranes for roofing. Uh, highly reflective pigments can be added to flexible PVC membranes so as to reflect um, the sun and uh, ensure a better insulation and reduce energy consumption. So as you see, another uh, uh, sustainable use of, uh, of PVC. And um, or, for example, they can be used uh, even for um, uh, tarpaulins uh, or, for example, for uh, architecture. So we have also amazing creations in flexible PVC. And uh, going to the next applications still related to films and shit, it's, uh, for example, uh, the, the wall covering which is used, for example, uh, or, for example, for the for the adhesives on uh, cars, uh, motors, and buses. Um, and they are used very often due to their versatility and, uh, and their value also. They are very cost effective. This is also an important um, thing that we, an, an important characteristic that we should mention about uh, flexible PVC. And they're also used in uh, the fashion industry for leather goods, for what we call uh, vegan leather. About automotive, their plasticizer and flexible PVC are really used in many, many parts of the car. And uh, in fact, the plasticizer can contribute to the quality and cost effectiveness and comfort of the vehicles. Why? Because the vegan leather, it uh, can be used for the seats. The underbody coating, um, it's uh, very useful because uh, it allows the car or the automotive to, to be um, to be lighter and so consume less energy. Uh, can be used in door inserts, uh, in the load cover. It can be used to insulate materials and, uh, and to the instrument uh, panel. So as you can see, there's, uh, there are very varied applications. With regard to flooring, for example, uh, PVC flooring can be used in hospitals or in sport halls. Why? But, well, because they absorb the shock. And it also ensures um, uh, more soundproofing and uh, it can be very easily maintained and clean, which uh, ensure high level of hygiene. 
for food pack Packaging, uh, specific uh, plasticizers, of course, are used for specific applications. So there will be certain plasticizers more used in food packaging than others. Um, and still, this is an interesting application because, of course, uh, it enhances and prolongs the shelf life of the products. And, um, and PVC is an excellent oxygen and water barrier. And this is uh, why actually it helps preventing unnecessary wastage of, uh, of food. Plus, PVC, as we all know, it's flexible, light, and cost-effective, transparent, tough, and safe, which are key enabler of, uh, of uh, food uh, preservation. There are no PVC applications uh, for plasticizers, as I mentioned. Uh, so, for example, plasticizers can help make ink and coating softer, more flexible and adherent. They enhance gloss and improve adhesion to problematic surfaces. And uh, within the formulations, plasticizers become an integral part of the ink film or coating and avoid the cracking. So this is really in a nutshell. And uh, if you want to know more uh, about uh, the different applications of plasticizers and also their sustainability and safety aspect, I really invite you to go on our website our portal plot platform where we share the information on plasticizers, which is plasticizer.org. And uh, you find all the different fact sheets. Um, recently, we have also started creating very, I believe, very nice videos. I will show you one just to give you an idea. Uh, presenting in, the, in a more funny way, actually, what are um, plasticizers useful for. And here, maybe I can pick up uh, this. I, Matthias Pfeiffer, Vice Chair of European Plasticizers. Wires and cables are insulated with flexible PVC that makes them durable and flexible over a wide temperature range. So even when your favorite artist sets the stage on fire, you can count on flexible PVC to bring the best music experience. Let the beat control your body. So these are short videos that we did to, to reach out to a broader audience also a diverse audience, including younger generation that need to know why plasticizers are so useful and flexible PVC can enhance their life, their everyday life. And, um, and so this is why we create more and more videos because we believe this is a, a very catchy way to, to attract people attention to, to the benefits of these substances. So I invite you to visit also our YouTube uh, channel and with this, uh, no, no. Uh, and with this, I think uh, I'm. I can conclude my presentation. And I thank you very much for your attention. And I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you so much, Michela, for your presentation. It was really interesting. We have a couple of of questions. Um, the first one is: Are there any restrictions or approvals for Cyclohexanoates? Cyclohexanoates, uh, yes. Uh, mainly we talk about DINCH. And um, DINCH uh, has uh, been assessed uh, under, maybe I can share the slides. Well, first of all, DINCH uh, um, is approved, for example, it's, it's been assessed by member state authorities uh, under RMOA. Uh, RMOA, it's, um, it's a risk management options analysis. And uh, actually, the outcome of this uh, analysis is that it can be safely used. And then based on the available data, there is no need for any measure restricting its use or um, uh, to avoid the risk because there's no risk. So currently, this is the situation for DINCH, so it can be used uh, safely in Europe. There, it's not classified and it's not restricted. OK, perfect. Thank you. 
we have another one is what is the current status of the phase out of the use of short chain chlorinated paraffins in the PVC industry? Could you give us uh, some remarks on this process in Europe? I'm afraid I am not an expert on this. So if you like, and also I'm not a technical expert as uh, you heard, so I can um, answer your question offline. I can uh, ask my colleagues. Uh, don't worry, Michele. Um, the other question is, as you mentioned, PVC could be recycled. Is it for all PVC applications? Could you please provide some information about it and some recommendations for developing countries to implement recycling instead of including PVC as filling materials? And I want to add another question that I have. Uh, you showed before that uh, all the tones in recycled uh, of, of PVC, uh, but I don't know if you have the percentage, uh, the annual percentage of PVC recycling in, in Europe. Yeah, I have it and I can find it um, briefly. I, If you give me a second. So uh, just to give you in a nutshell, just, I will start from the last uh, question. Um, in the previous commitment of Vanille Plus, uh, Vanille Plus uh, committed to um, reach by 2020 um, recycling amount of 800,000 ton per year of PVC. There were some delays uh, the last year due to COVID. It was very difficult to collect the data, uh, but actually we achieved these targets. And uh, this year when uh, there was the annual event of Vanille Plus, the, um, the amounts of recycled PVC were presented and there were above 800,000 euros. If you wish, I can find with you, I can share with you the Vanille Plus progress report, which uh, details the percentage also per application. In terms of, uh, I can find it now, but I'm afraid that I'm going to. Don't worry, Michela. Yeah, after but I'm going to yeah distract you probably, so it's better not to now. Uh, but uh, there are uh, further commitments in terms of recycling uh, towards 2030. And um, with regard to Vanille Plus, yeah, I think that Vanille Plus uh, sets best practices for uh, PVC recycling. Most of the PVC recycled in Europe is uh, um, is uh, window frames profiles, but then also flexible PVC can be recycled. Of course, uh, when um, uh, we talk about flexible PVC, we talk about uh, PVC containing some additives, some plasticizers, and uh, we know that there are some plasticizers such as the low molecular weight phthalates that were used in the past that are no longer used to a major extent today, but are still present in the PVC that you want to recycle today. Because as we know, PVC is very durable. So perhaps you can uh, recycle a flooring after 20, 30 years of usage. So this is uh, a challenge that the PVC industry in Europe is facing. So how to make sure that uh, the, these uh, additives that used to be used in the past do not remain in the new PVC. And um, for example, Vanille Plus is sponsoring several projects uh, for PVC recycling, both mechanical, mechanical recycling is still uh, the main uh, way to recycle PVC, but also chemical recycling. Uh, and this is uh, to, to solve, let's say, this issue of, uh, of additives, uh, which may pose a hazard today. And in fact, for all the other plasticizers, which are not the low molecular wave phthalates and which are used today in the new PVC, uh, this doesn't pose any, any problem for, uh, for recycling. And there are some companies that also uh, produce directly RC cores after, after the recycling of the, of the, of the PVC. Okay. But Thank if you, you want, after the event, I can share with you the links uh, to the different um, sections of the Vanille Plus website where you can find more detailed information. It will be perfect. Thank you so much, Michele. Uh, we have another question. Are there toxicological studies or analyses for, or, uh, for polymer plasticizers? Well, uh, rich registration uh, means uh, that um, depending on the tonnage of the products that you of the substance that you place on the market 
you have some requirements in terms of uh, testing that you have to perform. So um, polymer plasticizers, um, I do not know exactly their, their toxicological profile, but for sure we have data. So if you want, if you're interested, I can uh, check with my members that produce polymeric plasticizers and I can come back to you on this. OK, thank you so much again, Michela. Uh, Ronald, yes, we're going to share the the, the record of the of the of the webinar. Uh, I I have a, a question before another that uh, we have yeah. of uh, how many years did it take you to make the transition from uh, hazardous plasticizers to non hazardous plasticizers in Europe? Um, we have been, we count that the transition took place over 25 years. Well, uh, the point is that at the beginning, of course, uh, the low molecular wave phthalates um, reach was not existing and the, the substances could be used and they were used to a major extent. Why? Because DHP, for example, is a multipurpose plasticizer. It can be used uh, in many applications. It's very versatile. Uh, but then uh, still, the industry was still already investing into new substances. And in fact, uh, this helped the industry to keep the pace also of the regulatory um, evolution. And uh, But this took time, this took 25 years. And uh, But I believe that today with the transition from the low molecular weight phthalates to the high molecular weight phthalates, such as uh, DIMP, DIDP, DPHP, and the other plasticizers, teleftalates, uh, cyclohexanoates, et cetera, adipates, trimelipates, uh, we we can say that we have uh, substances that can be used safely and sustainably. They all have been assessed uh, by national authorities, European authorities, and some by international authorities as well. Okay, Michela, thank you so much. We have uh, a last question, but I want to ask something. Marta, discúlpame, TM te refieres a tonelada métrica? Sí, señora. Sí, exactamente. Vale, Sobre perfecto. todo, el, pues, digamos, o en general de los plastificantes, eh, pues, que están restringidos en Europa. ¿Cuál sí. es la cantidad para para ingresar si no se tiene la la certificación RISH o en el producto final no lo tiene? Ok, listo, gracias. Eh, Michela, uh, we have a last question. How many metric tons of um, different plasticizers? She specific. Uh, um, say that DEHP can be included in Europe if you do not have rich uh, certification. So currently, uh, so uh, the volumes for import export, uh, this is something I cannot share. Uh, we are an association and we cannot share this kind of information. What I can say is uh, that uh, um, DHP, like uh, the other three low molecular wave phthalates, DIM, sorry, uh, DIBP, DBP, and BBP are restricted. What does the restriction mean? Uh, that uh, actually the restriction applies to article. And so since uh, they can only be produced in Europe for specific applications under authorization and uh, they are restricted in, in several applications, also their import to Europe via the articles is limited. And uh, actually the um, quantitative of DHP in an article imported in Europe cannot be uh, above 0 0.1 microgram per kilo body weight. Per kilo, per, sorry, per kilo of the article, sorry. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much, Michela. We don't have uh, more questions. I think that it will be very interesting if you could share all the information and the documents and the links that you yep. that you said before. Um, and thank you so much again for this webinar for uh, um, support this this type of of topics uh, in Colombia. We have a, a sector, a big sector of PVC and this is this is important to to share. So thank you so much again and thank you to all our our participants and OK, have a good day to everyone. Many thanks to all. Gracias a todos que estén muy bien. Y les recordamos que compartiremos las memorias y la grabación posteriormente. Que estén muy bien. Hasta luego.
Vale. Gracias. Gracias. Vale, muchas gracias. Gracias. gracias.